Good evening and welcome. So glad that you're here. This time next week, we'll have already have been here an hour. Remember, next week we begin at 6 because VBS is kicking off. I haven't, uh, like I should have, I haven't talked about the subject matter of this year's VBS, but you've seen on the screens, if you looked at the announcement slides, uh, Redemption Ranch, branded in the image of Christ. Each lesson study comes from the parables of Christ, and they are really good. We'll, uh, we're going to get all five lessons in because Sunday morning I'm going to preach one of them. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach the very last one in the book, and that way we'll have all five lessons in. But next Sunday, remember, we're going to gather at 6 o'clock for our adult class and kick off VBS, and it will be a study from one of Christ's parables. All right. Now, it seems as if it's been about a month or so since we were in Romans. It's, it's actually been a while. We, uh, we probably would have been on into chapter 15 by now. However... We're going to jump into chapter 14, try to do as little rehashing as possible to get us there. Uh, but in chapter 12, the letter of Romans takes a swing, right? The first 11 chapters, Paul is dealing with uh, theological issues, salvation through faith in Christ, redemption in Christ. Uh, and he covers so much ground. Over and over he presents uh, different uh, lenses with which to understand salvation in Christ. But when he gets to chapter 12, he turns his attention to what that looks like, practical living, and that is bringing two people groups together under one roof in Rome, in the, in the church there. And so he's given us some very practical advice. I'm going to go back and actually read the first couple of verses in chapter 12 because that's where it sets the tone for what follows and it kind of helped get our, get our minds right for what we're going to study tonight. Chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect, and that is Paul's springboard for teaching these Christians how to get along with one another with their vastly different backgrounds. Jewish culture, Greek culture, mashed together in one place. So today we're going to talk about what potluck might look like. All right, that's that's what Jerry and I are, are most interested in. Is is what's potluck going to look like between these? two people groups because you would think the food might be pretty good bringing these cultures together. Paul is actually going to address that. So here we go, Romans chapter 14. We'll read the first four verses, and I'm going to go ahead and apologize to Elizabeth now because we're going to bounce around through the slides a little bit. So be, be ready, <laughs> be ready. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. Okay. As for the one who is weak in faith, do you really like the way Paul starts that? Because he 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 sets up he kind of sets up a value system here, a paradigm where we have to recognize that though there are those among us that are are weaker in faith than we are, which to understand that properly, it also means that there must be some among us that are stronger in faith. And so the question is, is who is the weaker in faith? Who is the stronger in faith? Admittedly, when we're looking at it through our own eyes, I'm always the stronger one in faith, right? Everybody here is the stronger one in faith, right? Yes, we are. And then when we look around the room, everybody else is the slightly weaker, slightly weaker in faith. That's kind of how it works. 
So right away, Paul establishes this, this paradigm that we have to think about and wrestle with. Uh, hmm, there's weaker in faith, stronger in faith, and Paul is fixing to lay it on us somehow. Okay, welcome him. And don't quarrel over opinions. That's, uh, that's kind of interesting, right? All right. So they can be weaker in faith. They are invited to fellowship. And we're not going to argue over opinions. And if we leave it verse 1 there, that leaves the door wide open for a whole lot of letting things slide, right? I mean, it does. It's just a, the whole lot of ambiguity there. Paul's going to narrow it down for us in verse 2. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Yeah, this is it, comical to me. It's going to be funny to Jared. But we have Greeks who've come to faith in Christ, Gentiles here in Rome. We have Jewish uh, brothers and sisters come to faith in Christ. They're in the church in Rome. These Jews have grown up. They're orthodox with the Levitical food laws, right? Mm, can't anything of the cloven hoof. Pork is out of the question. Did you know that uh, in Rome, the Greeks, they, they like pork, to which we say amen, right? We love us some bacon. You cannot make a pot of beans. You can't make a pot of peas without either a slab of bacon, a, a hog leg, and you've got to have some ham in it, something, right? We're going to have that. But if our Jewish brothers and sisters are sitting beside us, they're not going to touch it. They're going to make sure that nothing that they're eating with, their spoon, their ladle, their pot, their cup, their dish is not going to come in contact with it. And they're probably going to scooch down a few chairs away from you just to make sure they don't come into contact with that which they have always heard and been taught was unclean. And I hate that for them, right? So what does pot look, look like in the church at Rome? It's interesting here because we have one group that believes he can, may eat anything. That would be the Greek, Gentile. We can eat anything, right? Yes, we can. But then Paul designates the weak, remember Paul is Jewish, as the one who eats only vegetables. What did Daniel do when he was in captivity in, in Babylon? You remember? He was set, had the king's food brought before him. He, could, he said, it's unclean, I can't eat that. So he pleads, makes this deal, you know, let us eat only vegetables, come back and check us, make sure that we're healthy and everything, that kind of works out. Eats only vegetables. So we have Jewish people eating only vegetables, right? It's not that they couldn't eat meat, it's just that in this context of the church, they're probably not going to have uh, kosher meats to eat. So uh, the weak person in this scenario Paul has created is the one who's decided that they can only eat vegetables. Now, we step back and we look at Acts and we say, okay, Peter's on the rooftop in Joppa and he has this vision of his sheep being let down by the four corners and it all manner of, of beast and the, and the a voice says, rise, uh, Peter, kill and eat. And he says, no, I, I, I've never, never eaten anything common or unclean. The voice says, uh, don't call anything I've created common or unclean, and, and poof, food laws repealed. Well, church here at Rome, they don't have the book of Acts. It's not been written yet. They're, 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 these are Jewish Christians. They're trying to uphold uh, the laws of Moses. They're still observing feast days, things like that. They're being faithful, devout Jewish people while growing faith in Christ. So, how are we going to navigate potluck? We're going, to, we're going to let each do as they see fit to do. One person believes he may eat anything while the weak person eats only vegetables. Verse 3, let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains. All right. You know, if the guy sitting beside me does not want to eat the peas with the bacon in it, I'm okay with that. It's more for me, right, Jerry? I ain't going to have to eat it. I'm okay with that. And that's kind of where Paul's getting at it. If the one who decides he can't eat meat, uh, and there's a second part of verse 3 here, let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats. 
if I don't feel it's right, my conscience is not going to allow me to eat, eat the peas with the bacon in it, I'm also not going to pass judgment on the guy over here that has decided that it's okay to eat the peas with the bacon in it, all right? Why? Because God has welcomed him. Now, judgment here is, is used. Paul uses a particular word there in verse 3. Uh, and, lot, and, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats. Now, we, we talked about this before. I want to make sure we're clear. When Paul uses the word judgment here, it is in the legal sense. We're not talking about uh, how we judge people the way we think about them based on their lifestyle and everything. Judgment in Paul's context and Paul's context of the New Testament, judgment has to do with condemnation and punishment. It means I'm not going to take my brother who decides to eat and put him in a chair in the corner or throw him in prison or something like that for breaking a food law. We're not going to uh, bring about discipline on them for having decided to eat. So, uh, we have these two people groups. One's abstaining from the meats. One is abstain. One is only eating vegetables. One is eating the meats. So we have Greek, uh, Gentile coming together in uh, potluck with Jewish people, and they're just not going to pay attention to what each other's eating. They're going to respect one another's decision to either eat or to abstain. That's how we're going to bring about unity in this congregation. Paul spent 11 chapters bringing them together of unity and faith in Christ. Now he's, going to, he, now he's teaching them how they're going to come together physically, what this is going to look like when it's time to break bread with one another. They're going to, they're going to let each other slide. They're going to cut each other some space, right? Give each other some slack. Verse 4, he introduces this new paradigm to kind of understand using the word judgment again because it's going to introduce this scenario of servant and master. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It's before his own master that he stands or falls and he will be upheld for the Lord is able to make him stand. So what is implied is who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another is that that brother sitting beside you is the servant of Christ. He's not your servant. You don't get to pass judgment on him. And same thing for you. Uh, you are not his servant. He doesn't get to pass judgment on you. You are both going to stand before Christ. And the interesting thing is how Paul ends this. Whether you choose to eat or choose to abstain, Paul brings it all back together and says, and he will be upheld, not condemned, not judged, for the Lord is able to make him stand. He circles back around to Christ being the fullness of our salvation, even when it comes to food. Isn't that, uh, I think that's pretty great, pretty great. So we're going to be understanding, we're going to cut slack uh, one another. Jew, Gentile, they can come together, they can eat their meals together, and they're going to respect one another's right to choose so that their conscience be not offended. He is going to flesh this out more, but he's going to move from food to the feast days, festival days, right? So let's, uh, let's look at this text. One person esteems one day is better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord. Since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Okay, so now we've we moved to food regulations, and now we're looking at festivals or feast days. Now think about the devout Jew here. Now we've already talked about food laws. These, these weren't just traditions that we're talking about. We're not talking about... Uh, things that were kind of on the periphery. We're talking about food 
law, laws. And likewise here, feast days. These were likewise commanded to be observed. Think a Sabbath, Passover, the Feast of Booths or, or Pentecost. All these days that are determined by God for the Jew to remember and celebrate, to set this time aside, focus on God, and say in the case of Passover, rescuing them from bondage in Egypt. It is distinctly Jewish. It is distinctly for the Jews. Here in a couple of weeks, here in the United States, we'll celebrate the 4th of July, freedom, right? Well, that's what Passover was, a celebration of freedom given them by God over Egypt. Why would a Hellenistic Greek Roman want to celebrate Passover, right? Not really much anything in it for them. They're not really affected by it other than the guy sitting in the pew next to them is really thrilled about it, right? So we have a group of Jewish Christians that still desire to to observe the days, right? Sabbaths, Passovers, all those, right? While the Greek Christian, the Gentile Christian, it really doesn't mean anything to them. They've got no history in it. They've got no roots in it. Uh, how many of you guys celebrate Passover? I, I don't guess I ever have. I never celebrated. And I do take a Sabbath from time to time. One of these days we're going to have to do a deep dive into Sabbath and what that looks like now because Jesus claimed to be the new Sabbath. So that'll be a fun study. So we've got feast days and things like that. How are we going to get along now if we've got one people group observing the feast days or festivals and one people group that, well... Not so much. Don't feel bound to it. These feel bound to it because of the orthodoxy. These don't feel bound to it because they have a lack of history with it. Okay. Paul sets up the situation. One esteems one day better than another. These are the feast days. While another esteems all days alike. That would be the Gentile. Each one, this is, this is how Paul is measuring it out. Isn't this interesting? Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. Be convicted in what you feel. Don't be wishy-washy. Don't bounce around. If you decided that you need to observe this day, fine. Paul's going to introduce the realm in which that's going to operate. If you decided that it is not for you and you should not observe this day, fine. Just be fully convicted of it. Why? Why, why is it based on conscience? Because ultimately that's what it is. Verse 6 explains why this is important. The one who observes the day, this is the Jewish person, right, observes it in honor of the Lord. That's what each of these festivals and feasts were about. Whether you're talking about Sabbath, Passover, Pentecost, Feast of Booths, whatever, it was done to the glory and the honor of God. So great. And Paul brings that back into eating again. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord since he gives thanks to God. But then we're back to the one who abstains, abstaining from the festival, abstaining from the day, the feast day. The one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. Both, through how they are convicted in their conscience, are bringing honor to God. They're bringing honor th to God through their abstinence. One group, one group is bringing honor to God through their participation. Wow, it doesn't 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 jive with sometimes the the black and white readings we give to uh, achieving God's will. The fact is, is Paul helps us understand what he means here. All right, so verses seven. Through nine, Paul uses the language of sacrifice to help us wrap our minds around what this looks like. Now he's already told us back in chapter back in chapter twelve, verse one, that everything we do in the flesh is our spiritual worship. He's uh, pretty much just been kind of hammering on the Romans here to pursue unity. 
Now he's taught these, this people group here to look at laws that they've been raised up with, food laws, festival laws, and pursue unity with one another even above the law, which is an interesting concept for us. So he turns to sacrifice to help us understand how this looks. And his example is in Christ. Now, immediately, because it's Paul writing, I think of his language of sacrifice as it pertains to Christ in the terms of Philippians chapter 2, right? This is the humble servant who didn't think it was anything to leave the throne of God to put on flesh and to give his life on the cross. It's pretty amazing in and of itself. He died for us, putting his own will aside, obeying the Father even to the cross. So when we get to verse 7 here, none of us lives to himself. This is the language of sacrifice. It means whichever I choose, whether I choose to eat the meat or whether I choose not to eat the meat, whether I've chosen to celebrate the feast day or whether I've chosen to not, observe the feast day. I'm not doing it for myself. The choice I made is not based on my personal desire because, well, none of us live to ourselves. We're living a sacrificial life. Back to chapter 12, verse 1. None of us dies to himself. So whenever we choose to give up ourselves, whenever we choose to do something that causes us to step out away from our norm, that, that's, that's kind of the language of the New Testament, especially Paul, uh, is, is when we step out. I, I kind of liken this to like the first time I, I did anything in the church. I believe the first thing I did was to wait on the table not long after I was baptized. Got up here and stood and, and floundered around. I think I was supposed to be praying over the bread and I forgot my name. I couldn't, I couldn't even speak. I got him stuttered and stammered around and everything else. Somebody else had to finish the prayer for me. It's really embarrassing, pretty bad. And now we come to understand that, that sacrificing ourselves means putting on the image of Christ, which means doing things outside of the norm of what we would normally do. None of us lives to self. None of us dies to himself. All this or both is sacrificial living. Or if we live, we live to God. If we make the choice to observe the feast day, we make the choice to not eat the meat, fine. We're choosing to live to the Lord. If we die, if we choose not to observe, if we choose not to eat, that's fine. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's sacrificial. This is sacrificial living. For to this end, Christ died and lived again. So verse 9 is is a purpose statement. We like purpose statements because it brings clarity to the situation. For this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. See what Paul did? Whether you choose to eat or whether you choose to abstain, whether you choose to celebrate or whether you choose not to, If you're fully convinced in your mind that you're giving yourself sacrificially to Christ, you're pursuing his will earnestly, Christ is Lord both of the dead and of the living. Christ is the Lord of the one who has chosen to give himself. Christ is chosen or is the Lord of the one who has chosen who has decided to die to self. That's pretty great. Pretty great. So, we have two situations that Paul addresses very pointedly here. Food and feast days. He wants these two people groups to be able to get along with one another. When they have potluck, if you want to abstain, fine. Be fully convinced. If you want to eat, fine. Be fully convinced. Passover rolls around and you want to observe and participate, fine. Do so. You don't want to? Fine. Don't. Christ is both the Lord of the dead and of the living. 
we, we like that mainly because we choose to eat and we choose not to observe, right? And therefore fully convinced in our hearts that that's all right. So, yay, right? We're going to go home. We're going to have a ham sandwich. And when Passover and Pentecost rolls around, we're probably not going to talk about a whole lot. And we're probably not going to just eat bread and crackers and boiled lamb, right? Probably not going to do so. All right, this is where we're going to pull up Stop, sorry. Now, this does raise some very intriguing questions, uh, this passage, because Paul has taken Jewish laws and he's made them optional, right? He's made them optional for both the Jew. He's made them optional for the Gentile. His only stipulation is that they be convicted and then honor God through their decision. That's a pretty interesting concept, and he does so for the sake of unity. I'm going to leave it here with these two. Uh, for now, we're going to pursue the rest of chapter 14, which Paul is going to continue with sacrificial language. And then the, the back end of this chapter, and then this kind of one reason for not going any further, is because Paul establishes a concept in chapter 14 that merits some... Uh, discussion, some very pointed discussion about not causing one another to stumble. That's a pretty expansive, pretty expansive subject. Do you have any thoughts or questions about the lesson tonight, though? Here in the first few verses of chapter uh, 14, for the sake of unity, uh, Paul is willing to, to secede quite a bit, all right? What are your questions? Going once. Going twice. Potluck's next Sunday. Don't forget. It's a reminder. It made me think of it. I expect to see some pork products there. Maybe. Be good. Some vegetables. All right. <clears throat> we'll pick up. Next week, we're going to be in a parable. And then the following week, uh, nothing happens. We're going to pick right back up here in chapter 14 of Romans. Uh, if we can help you this evening, won't you come as we stand and we sing our song of invitation?